Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and assalamu alaikum. On behalf of the One Love Bermuda Ummah, we want to welcome you to this auspicious occasion entitled Man in the Mirror, Part 2. This evening promises to be an evening of information, an evening to continue the meal that you've started already. Inshallah, God bless you. I want to take the time to acknowledge a few persons who have gone out of their way to make it possible uh, to be here this evening. Namely, Brother Ishmael and his wife, Sister Nina, and all those who worked hard throughout the last few days to make this event possible. And how many of God willing, uh, we hope to reach this objective of transmitting some information that will be beneficial to all of us as we begin to look at the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror. I want to take time to acknowledge the imams of the local community in Bermuda, Imam Basim Wakil, the Imam of Masjid Muhammad, Imam Salim Razak of the Islamic Community Center, Cultural Center, as well as Imam Muhammad Khan, the representative of Masjid Kuhu. I also want to take time to acknowledge the Minister of National Security, the Honorable Michael Weeks, JPMP, along with his colleague, Member of Parliament, Mr. Kim Swan, JPMP. We want to take time and recognize, I saw the President of the Bermuda Industrial Union, Mr. Chris Burbitt. And of course, without a doubt, we want to extend a personal welcome, again, returning to Bermuda, Imam Shadid Muhammad. And of course to you, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your time to come out this evening to hear this dialogue. So now that we've started, you've had the meal, we're gonna push forward. We're gonna ask our brother, Dr. Llewellyn Simmons. He's the host of Old Fronts 102, Magic 102.7 comes on Wednesday evenings to give an introduction to our Imam, Shadid Muhammad. And then Imam will give a discourse for approximately 30 minutes at which time we will sit, digest, and then following his discourse, we would break for a salat, and then return for a question and answer period, inshallah, from the audience based on what was delivered uh, this evening. So that's the program for tonight, that's the lineup, and inshallah, we will do justice to this event. I now call on my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Luan Sanders. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, with protocol already established, I'm going to just jump right into it. But I can't jump right into it without first acknowledging, where's my little baby brother, uh, Dwayne Steve? Because I got the call, uh, not ox, I was told. And uh, you know, when your baby brother tells you, nah, you have to be here, you have to do this. Uh, there's never a doubt, there's never a, a rejection. I answered the call. And um, when he shared with me, you know, man in the mirror, then I understood what the purpose of uh, this community gathering is about. And so it directed me to sharing some things. You know, when, when, whenever I'm called, I'm always reflective. I was sharing with some of the men earlier when we were in conference, you know, my, my baptism into Islam comes from family member. My, my uncle Abdul, Abdullah, lot of name. And I always share the story because he left a profound impression on me as a young man. And as a young man, as, as, as one who exercises his voice, in the family home. So every Christmas time when he would come, of course, Christmas time, uh, we have Christian family members, we have non-religious members, and when Abdul came to the house and the family came, the main family, we knew that Islam was in the house, right? And so we would all gather around the table 
And in those early days, it was through the nation of Islam. And so, Message to the Black Man was the book that he introduced us young boys to. Read this. The next time we come, you're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about Islam. And then, with it was the transformation into orthodox. And we saw the evolution of another man. And so this has always had a profound impact on shaping who I am. And even when I look around, I see, and I was sharing earlier, some of my big brothers growing up, some of the model men before me, and some of the women who you just observe, and it's a certain character. And so I want to speak to this very briefly before we introduce Imam Shadid, because we've been talking about it, and it had me reading about the true men, true men, manhood, and masculinity in Islam. And I, I need my glasses for distance, and right now all of you are a blur, but the paper is well lit up for me. So, in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, with a variety of modern ideologies, philosophies, and religions competing to define what it means to be a man, it is ever more critically important for Muslim men to understand masculinity as it was understood by the righteous predecessors. Unlike theories of masculinity that promote the alpha male as dominating other men and women, masculinity in Islam is for a man to fulfill the good character traits and dignified manners taught by the religion as a whole. A true Muslim man is just Kind, compassionate, forgiving, responsible, hardworking, humble, patient, forbearing, truthful, trustworthy, courageous, soft-hearted, honoring women, controlling his lower desires and impulses, fulfilling the needs of others before himself, continually refining his intellect, improving his character, seeking knowledge as a lifelong learner avoiding undignified behavior and sinful deeds and emulating the character prophet and his righteous followers to the best of his ability. One of the most important characteristics of true Muslim men is the ability to forgive others even when the opportunity for revenge is available. This quality of compassion stands diametrically opposed to false belief of the alpha male as domineering and vengeful. Forbearance at a time of anger and forgiveness at a time of power. A man will not hit the mark nor fulfill his manhood until he has two characteristics, forgiving people and overlooking their faults. A true Muslim man should be kind towards people and love for them, the same as he loves for himself. He should give off a friendly and non-threatening aura, while also putting the needs of others over himself. A true Muslim man does not allow himself to be dragged into the gutter of insults, mockery, and bitter arguments. It is the beneath the dignity of a believer to put down or make fun of others, as this contradicts the spirit of goodwill he should have. Whoever belittles his brothers will lose his manhood. Moreover, the authentic sign of strength is the ability to control one's desires and impulses, especially anger. A man who cannot control himself is spiritually weak, even if he has the largest muscles of all. The truly weak man is he who is too weak to manage himself. A true Muslim man might have a smaller build than most men, but still be better to Allah than most men. For this reason and many others, a real man should never make fun of another's natural physical appearance. 
A true Muslim man is not ashamed to show his emotions in the appropriate moment. The prophet and his companions were crying and weep in public because their hearts were soft. The prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, visited the grave of his mother, and he wept and made others around him start weeping. A true Muslim man has chivalry and is honorable towards the women in his life, his mother, his sisters, his daughter, aunts, cousins, sisters in Islam and women in general. The measure of a man's character is directly related to how he treats the women in his life. The messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, the most complete of the believers in faith are those with the most excellent character. And the best of you are the best in behavior to their women. It is not the characteristic of true men to dominate women, degrade them, exploit them, or brag about their sexual conquest. In fact, it is precisely the opposite. A real man protects women who are vulnerable to abuse and injustice. In sum, a true Muslim man is characterized by a balance of all of the virtues taught by Islam. Justice, compassion, forgiveness, kindness, humility, patience, truthfulness, courage, responsibility, chivalry, and so on. The concept of the alpha male as domineering, aggressive, vengeful, thuggish, and strong is a false and toxic belief that encourages misbehavior in general and the mistreatment of women in particular. On the contrary, truly strong men are those capable of controlling themselves and traversing the highest straight path of virtue in opposition to the animalistic tendencies of the human soul. A true man, character in his manhood and masculinity in Islam is a model man. That is the man in the mirror. At this time, I call to the podium our brother, Imam Shadid Muhammad. And I know this is part two of a message that some of us have heard before. But as the man in the mirror, or the men in the mirror that we are, let it be true men in the character of Islam with that consistency. And we had conversation that I'm sure Brother Imam is going to build upon, you know, as we share in this moment as a community. Brother Imam, welcome back. Good afternoon to everyone, our esteemed guests, uh, our leaders, the Bermudian community. Thank you for the opportunity to come back and uh, address you again. Uh, piggybacking off on the same topic that we had the last time that I was here, which was before the pandemic, we talked about the man in the mirror. Essentially, some of what we talked about in today's khutbah, and that is being self-reflective, taking inventory of ourselves. Change starts with you first. So I'm going to lead uh, my discussion with you tonight with a quote, and then I'll elaborate and build upon that quote uh, as I make my way to the point that I want to address you about tonight. It was said that it is no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. I'll say that again. It is no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Meaning, if you look out in front of you and you see your society suffering from so many ills, 
psychologically, financially, socially, morally, and you see yourself to be impervious to those things, meaning untouched, unscathed by those, those things, you can't possibly consider yourself safe while you see everybody else around you sick. You are just as sick as they are. If you are living in that society and doing nothing about it. It's similar to what uh, drug dealers say when they go to jail and they are you know, put into programs, drug rehabilitation programs, so they can get a lesser sentence. And their, their famous statement is, well, I didn't used to get high. But you were providing those who got high with the drugs that, you know, with the, that they use. You are just as sick as they are. But in your mind, you believe, because I'm not a user, I'm not a, a, a using or abusing drugs and alcohol, then I'm somehow you know, impervious or I'm somehow in a class by myself. Meanwhile, you're the one that is supplying the society with the drugs. You are just as sick as they are. And so, in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'll use God interchangeably, sometimes I'll say God, sometimes I'll say Allah, but I'm referring to the same creator, Almighty, so that we don't get that confused. I do understand that in our crowd we have people here that are not Muslim, and we have people that are listening online that are not Muslim, and we want to make sure that we don't give off the wrong message, that when we say Allah, we're referring to some type of God that only Muslims worship. When we say God or we say Allah, we're saying the one true only God that deserves worship. Allah, God, put the responsibility of change on the shoulders of the people who desire change. The effort has to come from the proponents of change and the blessing of that effort comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. That Allah will not change the state or the condition of a people until at first they change the condition within themselves. Meaning, God is not going to do the work for you. He's going to bless the effort that you put forward if you choose to do so. But there's another verse in the Quran that is similar to this one. In Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. That Allah will not change the good state that he has bestowed upon a people until they change what is within themselves. Meaning, when God blesses you with a blessed situation, whether that be a situation with you and your children, whether that be a situation between you and your spouse, whether that's the situation of your community or your society, and you consider that situation to be a good situation, a good thing, Allah will not change that good state that he has bestowed upon you until you change, meaning until you show God that you don't appreciate the good state that he has given you. I was riding with Brother Suleiman earlier, and I said, you know, just kind of reflecting, you know, his daughter was in the car with us and she talked about the, the sunset yesterday. This is a conversation the child is having, right, about how beautiful the sunset was yesterday. And it, it takes, you know, sometimes you have to take a pause and, and, and just recalibrate for a moment. We're talking about a child who is observing the sunset. Takes the time out to observe the sunset. And, you know, as we're riding, you know, the brother, he says that, you know, living here in Bermuda, these are some things that we take for granted. We're going back and forth to work every day, the hustle and bustle of work. And we don't take time out to just stop and smell the roses. And think about what a blessed situation that you are in. And Allah is not going to change this blessed situation that you have until you show him that you don't appreciate the situation that he has given you. So the effort has to come from those who desire change. And then the blessing will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are a number of verses in the Quran, a number of situations in the Quran that show us this particular concept, highlights this concept. One was a situation right before battle, in one of the battles, 
Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is with a small army. He's always outnumbered. But numbers do not tell the full story. It's the end result that tells the full story. Because in the beginning, those who are righteous, those who ascribe to righteousness, always seem to be outnumbered. Because sin, criminology, cr criminality, criminal behavior, it always seems to be loud, but they are actually a minority. They're just loud. Righteousness is always the majority, but they're silent and afraid and timid until someone comes along and makes righteousness appear to be cool. This was the example of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, emerging in a society riddled with so many social ills. But he made being a man of God cool. And made being a man of God powerful. And it was only until he began to endure a lot of these things that people started to say, wait a minute, he's on to something here. But in this particular battle, right before the battle, the Muslims are outnumbered. The non-Muslims are standing there in their army and their armor and their weapons. And Allah commands Prophet Muhammad to pick up a handful of dirt, just a handful. He grabs a handful of dirt and he throws the handful of dirt. And that handful of dirt goes into the eyes of over a thousand soldiers. And in that moment, the Muslims rush them. Allah captures that incident in the Quran. Not the incident, but what happened as a result of that incident. Allah tells Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, You didn't throw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. What does Allah mean by this? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam picked up the handful of dirt and he threw it. But Allah says, you didn't throw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. Meaning, you did the work. The work was yours. The effort was yours. The end result of that was in the hands of God. Showing you that we are responsible for the effort. We are not responsible for the outcome. We are responsible for doing the work. We may not be able to stop gang activity, criminality. We may not be able to stop that. But we have to put forth the work and let God decide where that goes. But to sit back and say, this is society, this is, you know, this new age, this is this generation, and this is what it is, it shows our lack of confidence, our lack of conviction, and our lack of trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, you didn't throw when you threw, but it was I who threw. You threw the handful of dirt, but the benefit of that, the end result of that, was in my hands. Another example in the story of Maryam, in the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yeah, there's an entire chapter in the Quran titled Mary. Muslims, we love Jesus. We love Mary. We just don't worship him. That's it. Mary is the only woman's name mentioned in the Quran. Allah alludes to other women, the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya, but her name is not mentioned. Even Prophet Muhammad's wife, Aisha, alluded to in the Quran, but her name is not mentioned. The only woman's name that is mentioned in the Quran is Mary. Allah captures this particular incident that happened with her while she was pregnant with Jesus. She started to feel the pains of childbirth and she retreated to a place in the east by herself. Embarrassed, not really knowing how to explain this phenomenon of being pregnant without male intervention. And she's hungry. She has no food. And Allah tells her, وَحُزِّي إِلَيْكِ and shake the trunk of the palm tree and the dates will fall down on your head. Fresh dates will fall down on you. Now when you think about that, Allah could have shook the tree, sent a wind to shake the tree himself and made the dates fall down on her. 
But Allah wanted to teach Maryam and everybody who reads that story a lesson. And that is that God's help is always near, but you have to put forth the effort. You have to put forth the effort. Allah could have sent the wind to shake the tree and the dates could have fell down on her head. Wow, there you go. As in an earlier verse, every time Prophet Yahya, John, entered upon her chamber, he always found her with food. And he asked her, Anna laki hadha, where you get this food from? She said, the food came from God. Just as he provided her with the food in her chamber, he could have sent the wind to knock the dates down off of the tree to fall down on her head. But he commanded her to shake the palm tree and the dates would fall down on you, fresh. Teaching her a lesson that the effort has to come from you. The blessing will come from Allah, but the effort has to come from you. Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, he emerged in a society that was riddled with a myriad of social ills. From alcoholism, the Arabs, pre-Islamic Arab society, they were heavy drinkers. To such a degree that Allah did not, the Quran did not prohibit the usage of alcohol until 18 years after the message, the, the initial message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go figure. <clears throat> so much so that Aisha said that if the first thing Allah had prohibited was leave off alcohol, the people would have resisted by saying we will never leave off alcohol. Because if you're trying to take people from step A to step B to step C, that's a process. That doesn't happen cold turkey. Just stop immediately. So you'll find many of the prohibitions in the Quran give us the blueprint for how to enact change in our society. It's not going to happen overnight. It's a slow step, step by step process. But it has to be consistent and it has to be done with conviction. Believing that the end result will be exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised. And so emerging in this society riddled with social ills like alcoholism, female infanticide, the pre-Islamic Arabs, they used to bury their baby daughters alive. Go figure. Allah says in the Quran, وَالْمَوْعُودَةُ And when the female baby girl will be asked on the Day of Judgment, for what reason were you killed? For no reason other than the fact that she was a girl. So there were female infanticide, burying their baby daughters alive. Can you imagine emerging as a prophet? And this is a ubiquitous practice amongst this people. How do you convince them that women are equal to men? How do you convince them of this? When they're burying their baby girls alive. Men were inheriting women against their will. If a man had a brother and his brother had a wife and the brother died, the brother automatically inherited his wife as property. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu la yilhilu lakum an tarithu nisa qurha. Oh you who believe it, it is not permissible for you to inherit women against their will. This is what they were doing. He's emerging because when we talk about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we usually just talk about him combating shirk, idolatry, and that's it. We skip over the social ills that he had to deal with. And he made no bones about that. He addressed head on every single one of those social ills that existed in that society. While today we jump around that. Instead of meeting it head on exactly the way that it needs to be met. You can't compromise. You can't negotiate with these type of social ills. You have to meet them head on with the exact same force or even more or even greater than the force that they come with. Otherwise, you will be overwhelmed, you will be overcome by these things. You can't play with it. Because these are the tools that Shaitan uses to break down the foundation of every single society. And you guys have a blueprint of what not to do based upon what you see in societies like America, 
what has happened to the African American. You have a blueprint of what not to do because this has already preceded, this came before you. And so you can study situations, situations, societies to understand how to combat the ills of your society. And this requires the collective responsibility of every single one in this room. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting back thinking it's the imam's responsibility or the preacher's responsibility or the church's responsibility or the mosque's responsibility while you sit back and that was man's relationship with God. You have to think why did, if Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is looking at his society, looking at all of these ills in front of him, you got to look at strategically what he chose to combat first. And the very thing that he chose to combat first was man's relationship with God. Because that's where it starts. That's where it starts. And if you think about the breakdown of our society today, especially with many of our youth, it is the separation or the disconnect between their relationship with God. This is how Shaitan starts. Because once you separate man from his creator, disconnect him from his creator, then you disconnect him from all of the morals, the values, the guidelines that come with that connection to the creator. In our tradition, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ that if you have no modesty, no shyness, then do as you please. Scholars, they say that this means that when a person lacks modesty and shyness, then they will do as they please. And this is what social media is attacking with many of our children. This is Shaitan's thumbprint on our society, and we have to remove that. By showing how much, how much more we are convinced of the power that is in Revelation. And so through recalibrating and improving man's relationship with God, all other relationships are put into their proper perspective. When you think that he emerged with the message, La ilaha illallah, there is no God or deity that deserves worship except Allah, except God. Think about that message for a moment. Seems very simple. But that is what is called a transformative message. Meaning the moment you embrace that message and everything that it entails, change automatically begins to happen within you and within everybody around you. It's natural. And so if our youth are embracing la ilaha illallah, converting to Islam today, but change is not happening, then there's something wrong with the way that the message is resonating with them. Nothing wrong with the message. It's the problem is the way that they are receiving it and the way that they are processing what this message is all about. Because when we look at the early generation of Muslims, we see their embracing of Islam, embracing of la ilaha illallah, but we see a ripple effect of change within their society. So why don't we see that happening now? What happened? And so Prophet Muhammad وسلم, his message began resonating with four categories of people. Number one, the youth. You find many of the youth begin gravitating towards the message of La ilaha illallah, no different than the way the youth are gravitating towards it today. Right? One of the things Malcolm X said that Elijah Muhammad told him is to focus on the youth and the elders will follow out of shame. Focus on the youth. Because that's where Shaitan starts. You know how Shaitan gets our youth? He doesn't get the youth in their youth. He gets the youth later on as they grow, but the trauma starts in the youth. Shaitan starts with the traumatization of the child. Because through the trauma, they're not able to process the emotions that come as a result of that. And they're all over the place with their emotions. You traumatize a child enough, they will never be able to recalibrate. Even those of the children that were traumatized that convert to Islam or were traumatized as Muslim children in Islam, they're still not able to recalibrate and start all over because the trauma is too deep. It runs too deep. So you begin to see traces, remnants of the trauma in even how they practice their religion. They can't escape it. 
And Shaitan knows that. He's been following this blueprint from the very beginning. Traumatized the children, destroyed them in adulthood. And this is why Frederick Douglass said what? That it's easier to do what? Raise strong children to, to fix what? Broken men. <clears throat> it's easier to raise strong children than to fix broken men. A lot of wisdom there. Pay attention to the type of experience we are given to children. Traumatized enough, a child will never be able to recover from the damage that has been done to them in childhood. And thus shaitan, they become, you know, pawns, fodder for shaitan's playground. But la ilaha illallah begin appeal to the youth. Why does it appeal to the youth? Because the youth are risk takers. They welcome things that go against the norm. Most of the protests that you see happening on college campuses around the world, specifically in America, as a result of what is happening, the genocide that is happening in Palestine is as a result of youth. Young people willing to go through. Older people are not, you know, you're more settled in life. You got a house, you got a mortgage, you got a family, you got children. You know, you're paying for college for this one. You're, you're you know, you're settled in life. You're not trying to ruffle anybody's feathers. Young people don't have any children, they're not married, they don't have, you know, they're willing to take risks. They don't have a lot to, to lose. And if we can't see that our bread and butter is in our youth, we've missed the per we're, we've missed the call. And you go into many of our mosques, many of our churches, and you find the age demographic, as I said last night, between 22 to 35 absent. And those are the shakers and bakers of society. Those are the people who change society. But how are they missing from our religious institutions? Because many of our religious institutions have very little to offer them. We have very little to offer. So they go out in the world trying to find a way to make their mark. Because they come home to the religious institutions and there's really, you know, they get wrapped up, you know, get blocked out by the gatekeepers and the red tape of the politics that go on in many of our institutions. Allah Musta'an. So they try to find their niche in other places. But you find a message of La ilaha illallah registered with the youth. Many of the chiefs of Quraysh who became the arch enemies of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their children converted to Islam. Abdullah bin Umar, Abdullah bin Abbas, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Um Habiba, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, and then Muawiyah, her brother, the son of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was one of the arch enemies of the Prophet and both of his children converted to Islam. Um Salama, Hind bint Abi Umayyah, Abu Umayyah, one of the chiefs of Quraysh. Many of their children started to convert to Islam. This created a revolution. As they say, the revolution will always lie with the youth. Young people will always be proponents of revolution in society. And the more and more we keep boxing them out, the more and more we keep moving them away from our religious institutions, not creating a home for them and welcoming, welcoming them into our communities with their skill sets and with their energy, the more and more they're going to go out into society and find other places to invest that energy in. And thus our mosques, our religious institutions are filled with the elderly and small children. The message of Islam at the beginning began to resonate with women. Why? Because women saw the liberation that Islam was offering them. As a matter of fact, non-Muslim women used to come to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and they used to act like they wanted to become Muslim and take their shahada only so that they could benefit from the perks of being a Muslim woman. That's how much Islam offered of liberation. There's an entire surah in the Qur'an, Surah Al-Mumtahina. Surah Al-Mumtahina, the woman who is tested. Allah commanded Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that when a woman comes to you saying that she wants to take shahada, then test her to see if she's really coming to Islam for the, real, for the right reason. And when I said this a few months ago about many of our youth coming, taking shahada, and then leaving out and going to join gangs, and that imams need to pump their brakes with just giving people shahada and create a system 
by which you can welcome young people into the religion, into the community, not just giving them shahada and sending them back out. Muslims talked about me as if I was speaking a different language. Meanwhile, it's right there in the Quran. All you who believe when it comes to you women saying that they wanted to become Muslim, and Allah knows best whether they truly believe. You're not judging what's in their heart, you're judging what is apparent. And then there were a number of conditions and stipulations that they had to accept before they would be welcomed into the Muslim community. Allah said that they will not steal. They will not kill their children. You can't bring all of that into Islam. That we have to stop you at the door. You don't get to just, as I, I said in the back room, that you know, Christians have kind of dropped the ball somewhat in you know, trying to appeal to the people to come into the church by saying, come as you are. And you bring in all types of stuff into your religious institutions. In Islam, there is no come as you are. Come as God told you to come. That's, we stand on that. That's a standard. We don't go beneath the standard. No, you can't come into our religious institutions smelling like marijuana. No, you can't come into our religious institutions with skirts sh sh uh, sh jacked up to your thighs. No. No, you can't come into our religious institutions as a woman transitioning into a man and go on the, the men's side or a man transitioning into a woman and going into the women's side. Islam doesn't recognize that. Islam sees you as the gender that you were born with. We don't have to play your game. That is your game, that you're playing with your own mind. How far and how deep do I have to go with the game that you are playing, the self-delusion that you are, you are encapsulated by? How far do I have to play with that? You see yourself as a man when you're really a woman. I don't. You don't get to dictate to me how I address you because that's the way you see yourself. When you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I'm he, I'm them, I'm they, that's fine. But I see you as a man. You're a he. I see you as a woman. You're a she. You don't get to dictate to me. This is the ultimate gaslighting that has been done on the entire world. Mm -hmm. No, I identify as a woman, but I'm a man. Well, I identify as a man who sees you as a woman. How about that? <laughs> if you can identify, you can be a woman and identify as a man, then I can be a man that identifies as a man that sees you as a woman. We can play this game all day long. You want to play mental mind games? Fine. But I refuse to make you, allow you to change my reality because you decided to be dissatisfied with your reality and change yours. I'm comfortable with the way that God made me. If you are dissatisfied with your reality, the reality that God gave you, then I'm sorry. But I don't have to play that game with you. But here we go, placating the feelings of others for numbers. We're trying to fill up our mosques, trying to fill up our churches, right? And so come as you are. No, you come as God told you to. Islam appealed to the elderly who hated the direction that their society was going but did not have the power to change it. So when someone comes along and stands up to the oppression, they jump right behind. And lastly, la ilaha illallah, the message of la ilaha illallah, it appealed to the disenfranchised, the slaves, the poor, the oppressed, because it granted them liberation. So that is the one thing that is consistent with all of the categories that were, you know, affected by the message of Islam, and that is that it provided liberation in one way or another. And if we really understand what I'm saying here is that the power in changing our society has already been given to us. Mm -hmm. It all depends on whether or not we are convinced enough and committed enough to use it. And as Prophet Muhammad said, I'll end with this, 
من وجد خيرا فليحمد الله ومن وجد غير ذلك فلا يلومن إلا نفسه. That whoever finds good, then let him thank Allah, praise Allah. And whoever finds anything other than that, then let him blame nobody but himself. We have to take responsibility for the condition that we allowed to happen in our society. It's not social media, it's not you know this or that. Yes, those are symptoms of the real problem. Those are symptoms. The real problem starts with us. Our homes, our strategies for raising our children, and the things that we allow to take place in our society while we remain silent about it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah, God Almighty, to bless us with the ability to make positive change, healthy change in our society. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to instill within us the conviction and the commitment that is necessary to maintain the order that he has sent down in his revelation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us, we ask God to make us people of him, people of God. And stand for him and stand for his laws, his rules, his guidelines without compromise and without negotiation. Thank you all. I appreciate your time. I please appreciate your your listening. Check Ben. Check Ben. Check Ben. A wonderful discourse. Inshallah, we will make salat now. Salat to Maghrib. Um, I'm not sure where the room is. Prayer room. Just inside. Here. Okay, we're just for here. Okay, so we'll break for a few moments for us to make some lot, and then we will resume the conversation, inshallah, with a bit of discourse or question and answer that you might have for Imam Sadid and Dr. Simmons. <laughs> Thank you.